my name is Melissa Gonzalez. I'm going to bring out the panel, and then we'll we'll talk more. Fun. Come on. You guys want to come on. On. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for staying through the day to hear our panel and for everybody that's uh, watching online. My name is Melissa Gonzalez. My company is Lioness Media. We're a creative agency for emerging brands. We specialize in pop-up shops and most recently e-commerce to work with brands for activation, awareness, and sustainability strategies. Uh, through that time, you know, I've gotten to meet some amazing designers, some of which we have on the stage today. And what we do when we work with brands via the pop-up shop or, or online is to be their storyteller and get people to know them on a human level, their passions, their inspirations, their design process. So I invited three to come to uh, participate today so you can get to know them a little better and how they made their brands human. So I'm going to start with letting each one introduce themselves. Okay, my name is Chris Hura, and I am the CEO and founder of Sustain You Clothing. Uh, what we do is make 100% recycled clothing all in the United States using the old textile mills of the South, uh, primarily for universities, but also private labeled for larger apparel brands. So we're using what's already existing, we're creating jobs, and we're also using a innovative new technology to do that. Hi, my name is Andrea Tobin, and I'm the founder of Marla Cielo Handbags. And um, what I do is I make um, woven leather handbags out of original artwork. So I paint big pieces of leather and um, I work with a factory in New York to weave into a big giant textile and then I cut bags and they're all um, one of a kind. Excellent. My name is uh, Fu and it means lucky in Chinese and my company is Fu. E equals F-U to the power of eight underwear. And basically my underwear line is uh, fairly new. It started in June. Uh, the concept started in my head in March and basically everything is made in New York City which is part of the uh, selling point of them. Okay, so ironically everybody's here made in the US. Um, and Jeff can attest that the underwears fit well, so well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, model it. <laughs> That's for the after party. Uh, so, so we'll follow up with each, each one of the panelists. We'll with, start with Andrea. Who is Marla and how does she engage her audience? So um, that's the million dollar question, but um, I started the brand um, actually because I, I became an artist sort of out of the blue and I started painting a lot and um, my original intention was not to make handbags or anything, it was just to do something with the art and I would spend a lot of time making these pieces and I would fall in love with them so I thought it was a little weird to carry around you know, a canvas and um, one day I decided I had to make something out of it and handbags made the most sense and um, from the beginning it was very personal to me. Um, the name Marla was sort of a nickname I actually had in college and there wasn't much of a thought, it just was very obvious to me that the identity um, behind the artwork was sort of inspired by this persona that developed in my life so I made the company around her. and. Um, it also works, art is very personal, so it worked as a, a shield for myself also when you're showing something very personal and then trying to sell it to the public. Um, doing it through her kind of helped me navigate that. And Andrea's done a good job because if you go to her Facebook page, you kind of get to feel like you're taking a tour around the world with Marla. She shows Marla's, uh, Marla's thought process and creative process and where she travels. And so um, I sometimes call her Marla instead of Andrea because of it. Uh, Fu, so who's the man behind the formula? And how does that work with your brand? Well, basically, um, as I mentioned before, Fu means lucky in Chinese. And, uh, but in America, it's, you know, very provocative. It can mean a gazillion different things depending on who I say it to. Um, even when I'm on the phone with like customer service and generally when you're making a customer service call, it's never, you know, something pleasant. So I have to spell my name out. F is in Frank, U is an umbrella. Because if they're like, so what's your name? And I say, foo, F-U, they're thinking I'm saying something completely different. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's very short, concise and to the point. And as I mentioned, I uh, thought that it was just uh, lent itself to underwear. So I always wanted to do fashion. So I really thought about it long and hard and really thought about, well, what's the best, uh, you know, thing I should introduce? And I thought, you know, underwear is really perfect for this. I mean, it just lent itself to that. So Chris, um, one of your catch catchphrases for your company, can I speak English? <laughs> one of your catchphrases is, wear a better story. Um, so how do you keep 
your collaborators and followers being part of your story? Um, I think it's very easy for our company to, to be engaging to our audience, whether they be our, our consumers or their, our partners that actually help us make uh, the apparel because it is um, a communal effort. It really calls for the revital revitalization of a lot of old factories in the United States. Um, we do this through uh, videos and some uh, just interaction with the actual people who are getting jobs from this new technology. Um, so for me, wearing a better story means wearing something that is more sustainable, something that can be a game changer in our economy, something that can help people get um, out of poverty and also uh, create, create a type of fiber that we can actually export out of our country to um, help our economic crisis we're in. So that your, your followers get to feel like they grow with the company and they're a part of it and therefore they're more sustainable. Absolutely. I think it's um, a perfect example. If you get something that's made from a plastic bottle and you have a plastic bottle in your hand, you're more willing to put that into the, the trash can that says plastic. So I mean, you, all three of you have been successful in creating uh, a humanization of your brand. And then with that, those positive angles, there's always some challenges. So I'm going to ask each one of you about the challenges you faced with your brand being human and how it's evolved. So I'll start again with you, Andrea. Like I said, sometimes I call you Marla. Um, what kind of things have, have come to you because your branding is so strong and there's been confusion from your customer? Um, basically, situations like that, I've had um, and most of them have been positive. Sometimes people feel a little weird. They, they almost feel like they're offending me sometimes if they call the wrong name. But I think the best way to, to navigate that is just to embrace it. And, and actually, for me, it makes me feel really good because it makes me feel like I've been successful in giving the brand a personality. But I've had um, a lot of examples. I had a woman get in touch with me because she had a dog named Marla, actually. And she <laughs> fell in love with the bags and wanted to buy only my bags. And um, loved the story behind uh, you know, what my bags were and told me all about how she named her dog Marla. Um, I had another girl actually named Marla Cielo, which is the actual name of my company, and she was so excited because she had never met anyone with her name before, and I had to break it to her that it wasn't actually my name, but, uh, but it worked out. And um, it's, I mean, all in all, it's been a, a very positive experience. And, and Chris, you've been successful with Sustain You and building this collegiate community, but you started out doing it as having them be brand ambassadors. Um, but, but how have you evolved that? Because that wasn't as sticky of a formula to be part of your company, um, sending them your brand versus having them engage with your brand. How did you make that transition? Well, I think during our first year of business, we saw that um, it was a small operation and we were trying to reach a large audience of people. So we thought that individuals on campuses would be able to tell the story of Sustain You themselves. And, as all college kids, they have very little time on their hands. So uh, instead of doing it on an individual basis, we decided to uh, engage them in a larger way, which is the One Shirt campaign, in which um, last year when we transitioned away from the brand uh, ambassadors, we were able to reach 90 plus campuses um, in 38 states, and we collected uh, over 16 tons of clothing just through one effort. So I think that moving into a more communal, more viral, uh, space rather than uh, instilling one person with duties was was really the key that let us reach a broader audience. So they felt like they were part of the family, not just, oh, I'm getting some free stuff. Exactly. Yeah, we sent a lot of free stuff out there. Too, so. <laughs> Um, and Fu, so you, you talk about uh, really differentiating your formula being your brand. Um, there's a lot of underwear brands out there. And most of them have their logo on the label. So how do you create a different story with your logo and, and connecting to the message of your brand? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, um, I can say that I did a lot of research into the underwear business before I went into it so that, because, you know, they say knowledge is power. And um, basically, I found that there's a lot of designers that basically just have the designer's name or there's like a, some sort of formula. Um, for example, there's two different brands uh, that come to mind immediately. One is called Two, um, and then the uh, words Wink, W-I-N-K, Twink. And then there's another one that actually is literally, I'm not making this up, it's called Four, the number, and then Skins, S-K-I-N-S, which you know is kind of cute, but then it can get really uh, old really fast too. Whereas my underwear line is actually, it has my name, which is, you know, I'm the designer, and then there's actually a formula that is, looks like a very Einsteinian, because it's E equals F-U to the power of eight. And uh, there's an 
it's not just a formula just to be cute. It really is my trademarked patented formula for uh, the pleasure principle, which is a real principle that exists, and I created a formula for that that I trademarked. So my marketing is life is short, maximize your pleasure principle. And to reach out and make it more human, I basically also contacted a lot of underwear blogs for people who are underwear connoisseurs and told them I have a new line if they wanted to write a story about it. And so far, I've had about seven, eight stories within the past two, three months uh, because of that. Well, you're getting your name out there pretty quickly as as the pleasure principle, so that's, <laughs> so that's a nice catchy one-liner for people to know you as. Um, I mean, I think everybody in this uh, stage is growing at different stages, so, you know, maybe Chris, um, you can share with the audience early on, you, we have the brand ambassador example and how you transition to that, but any, anything, just kind of one example of a, a challenge you really faced early on and getting your brand to, to be seen as human that you can share with the audience that would be helpful for their companies? Yeah, I think that um, the information behind what is in a product is so important. And transparency nowadays, people are really demanding more transparency in the marketplace. And so for our company to really put that online uh, in video format and in Facebook and in different mediums was super important. And for it to be done in a really um, high quality way, because you know sometimes you can give the um, perception of being bigger than you are just based on your uh, website or your Facebook or your Twitter following and that's a good thing it gets people to really buy into your concept and, and also look for products that are like-minded as well so I think that in the beginning getting that information correctly uh, on our uh, different social media outlets was a challenge just financially um, but when we were able to kind of come into a place where that wasn't uh, so much of a challenge, really getting into the factories, telling the human stories, and then getting people to really listen to them, um, and then wanting to listen to them, was uh, we saw a huge upsurge in, in orders and quantities in which we were able to uh, produce. Yes, and content is king, as everybody knows, so that definitely, and the more content you have on your site, the more search engines are going to find you, and so, and Andrea, with you, I mean, I've, I've, presented your brand to many people on, on, on TV and pop-up shops and e-commerce and it's, it's always been uh, your design process that's been a really big key of your story. Can you just, you know, kind of share how Marla comes out in you that, it, that ignited the brand being a, a human brand? Yeah, that's definitely been the trick for me. I mean, it was, it was inherent to me from the be beginning. I think when you start from artwork um, that is so personal, just naturally, there, there was no other way to go about it. But, um, and I, I think what I realized early on is that there's a lot of power, especially at this time in this uh, economic climate, there's a lot of power behind letting people into your story and letting them taste it and feel like they're a part of it because, um, People don't want mass production anymore. They're starting to realize, you know, the, the negative aspects that come out of uh, overproducing, and um, and they want to see that story. So similar to Chris, I mean, I've done a lot with um, videos in the factory, videos of my painting process. I mean, the anything I can do to let people in behind the scenes and explain that has been very, very helpful for me. And then, Fu, I know you're still early in your process of figuring out the direction of some of your looks. You let your audience participate in telling you colors they want, fit they want, et cetera, so they feel like they're part of your growth process. Can you? Yeah, basically, um, when I first started out, I did the basics, which is, you know, the known tidy whities And then it was uh, actually um, a customer out in Canada who emailed me and asked if, uh, you know, he, uh, they were available in color. And at first, I was going to tell him no, because I wasn't quite ready to do any sort of colors yet. But then I thought, you know what, it's kind of silly, because my stuff is made in New York City, as everybody else's here is also made in America. So that part is, you know, the humanization, because it's not made in uh, an overseas developing country. I mean, it's made here so people can relate to it, especially in Manhattan. And, um, you know, I told him, I said, I could do it. So basically, it's because of that little push. Basically, somebody who reached out, I basically made it accessible. And now I have, you know, different colors, black, gray, uh, red, blue, purple, pink, and um, I think one other color I can't think of right now. <laughs> purple? Um, purple? Did you say purple? Yes. But I think what's important in that is that, you know, you're accessible, uh, but keep the conversation two-way, so your audience is going to more likely continue to talk to you because they know that you're going to respond back, and it's not just a one-way conversation, right. and that keeps it more human because that's how real life works. So um, thank you so much, and I uh, hope you have a rest, good rest of the panels.
Thank you. Thank you.